Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry. Hello and welcome to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. Folks, for this week's show, I speak to Brian Penny, who has an amazing story and also says he shouldn't be alive today. With a drug addiction so bad that he was deemed too much of a risk for detox, he was determined to confront his demons and he went cold turkey at home, which is when his life truly began. After 15 years of chronic heroin addiction, he was finally clean and he discovered that he had a second chance at life. In his new book, Bonus Time, Brian tells us a story how he turned around a seemingly hopeless existence into a rich and rewarding life, showing that change is always possible no matter how stuck we feel. And Brian is going to share his top five essential tips to help you live your life on your own terms. Brian, welcome to Real Health. How's it going? It's going great, Carl. Thanks for having me. Really looking forward to this. So yours, it's an incredible story, turning one, uh, your life around. Um, I suppose, take me back and give the listeners a feel or, and, a, and a, a feeling of life as an addict and how that was for you. Yeah, life, life as an addict. And I, I always start, I won't go into the depth of it, I always start that, and it's for many people in addiction. Like my, my, my addiction was really driven through childhood trauma. I had a lot of trauma in earlier life that really primed me for a life of anxiety. So, so I, I have to tell people, I didn't have an addiction issue. I didn't have a heroin problem. I had an anxiety problem, a, a compulsive thinking problem. And I really just used a drugs to, to, to medicate that problem. And that, that, was, that was my life um, for many years, like just battling, battling, uh, battling anxiety with drugs, living, living a life. Like it's really strange as well. Like a lot of people would often say, like, why choose heroin? Why choose, why, why choose a certain drug? It's such a, such a potent drug. And I suppose at an earlier age, I, I used many drugs, like, like a lot of young kids around the area where I grew up with was alcohol, it was hash, it was tablets. We start messing around. But I didn't seem to have an off button. I didn't seem to have that uh-oh moment of where that's too much. And I remember I, I, with me and a couple of friends, we says, right, we try everything once. It was like a Jim Morrison thing. We were mad into Jim Morrison. And I remember the first time I'd done heroin. It was supposed to be the only time. And there's a whole chapter of my book dedicated to the first night doing heroin. And the one memory I have, it was like a soft, warm blanket was just wrapped around my soul. And it was like the voice of heroin came into me that night. It was like, keep me close and I'll protect you. And I remember just saying, I, 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 I listened. I, I listened to that voice because the comparison to me previously anxious self was just far too much, and that sort of drove me. That that kept me in addiction for many years thereafter. And let's start with I suppose the anxiety. If that's okay, in terms yeah. of what's your earliest recollection of that, and do you know where that came from, and what kind of festered it? Yeah, so so I, I was only when writing the book that I had this realization. I'd done a lot of research. So I was born with a condition known as intestinal malrotation. So my guts were basically twisted. And I went under, I had an operation. Now, it was only doing research for the book that I realized that the medical practice at the time didn't realize that infants experienced pain like normal people. So I went under the knife without a general anesthetic. I had a huge operation without a general anesthetic, which was crazy. And it was only in 1985 that they realized that this was like a shock. And the medical practice were like, how are we doing this for so long? It was based on weak neurological evidence. So I had complications from that operation as well. So the first year of my life, I, was sp- I spent crying as an infant. And um, since I've gone back and done a degree in psychology, I've learned I, I was classically conditioned to fear the world as a very, very dangerous place. So I believe that primed me, like me fight and flight response would have been on red alert all the time. And it primed me for a life of anxiety. I was always a very anxious kid, a very uh, restless kid. And then I came from a loving family, but in alcohol, uh, there was alcoholism in the family as well. So I, I, I remember so many nights as a kid, like every weekend, a couple of nights a weekend, just sitting up at the window waiting for my mom and dad to come home from the pub drunk, because I knew to be drink driving. So. I suppose I was very analytical. I was always analyzing things. I was always worrying. And it, I think that just drove me, drove me anxiety to a different level. And yeah, that, that's, that's what it was for me. And what was the first time that you turned to substance abuse to help to, to, to deal with that anxiety? Yeah, it's funny. Back then, we didn't have the language for anxiety. And when I, when I think back, when I try to retrospectively think back of what it was, I think I believed everyone sort of felt like me to an extent. I knew I was very uncomfortable with myself and I didn't feel good. But I didn't know that other people felt calm. I didn't know what a sense of peace was. And I was very much interested in football. I was I, I was taught I might have been a professional footballer. Like I had high hopes for football. And I got an injury at 14 years of age. 
And I start, I, I took a puff of my first cigarette. I remember all my friends were smoking cigarettes. And I was like, there's no way would I touch a cigarette. I ruined my football career. But I remember taking a first puff of the cigarette because one of the lads actually says, I get nice head buzz off that. Now, I'd say I was getting curious. A lot of people are trying to hash around my eyes. The curiosity was building. I says, oh, head buzz. A lot of bit of that. And I liked the little head buzz I got. And I remember within weeks, I was smoking hash with the lads. And what what I've learned in 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 the later years of it, I have a very impulsive nature, and I I bring things to different kind of limits. And I was smoking a lot of hash. I started selling hash pretty soon after that. Day, so I could buy more hash. And I was taking, I was doing petrol in the fields, and taking over the next year or two, just taking acid, taking ecstasy, and just really ramping up the levels of different kinds of drugs. Okay, and was there, did that lead to one particular low point at which you decided, okay, this is now time to change and to make that change? If, to get out of addiction. Mm. Yeah, so, so like when I, when I was 17, I tried heroin for the first time. And then when I was 20, that's when I really got like heavily addicted to heroin. I had a panic attack and I spent 15 years deep in addiction. So it took a long, long time um, to, get, to get to that point. Like I was in, I was in deep addiction for a long, long time. But it was when I always considered myself a functional addict. It turns out I wasn't very functional in the end, but I considered myself a functional addict. I, ha- I held down a job I, for most of that time. And um, it was only when I stopped functioning and I lost everything in the world. Like I had no way of making money anymore. I lost my job. I lost my health. I lost every important relationship in my life. And to be quite honest, like there's pictures and um, people have seen pictures of me before and after addiction. I was on that store. Like I was looked in a very, very bad way. And it was only one place. It was time to sink or swim, time to live or die. And I remember that was the first time I said to myself, right, I think I'm going to have to seek professional help here and actually try to get clean and try to do something about this. And that was the moment that gave me a bit of an insight that I need to get clean. But I was still wanted to hold on to a couple of drugs. Like I still wanted to get clean because I, I had a story that I told myself. I cannot cope with anxiety and I need heroin to survive. So I was willing to give up the heroin because I thought that was causing all the problems, but I was still gonna do some drugs just to medicate myself. And I was forced to do a home detox, a detox at home because I was taking so many bends of diazepine. And um, I said, I was an insurance risk for detox. And he says, right, you have to get them out of your system first before you can get in. So I done that home detox and two days into that home detox was not only the most painful night in my life, it was also the most important night in my life. It completely changed my perspective. And to, to cut a long story short, what, what basically happened was I had a grand mal convulsive seizure. The book actually starts with this, uh, with, with the prologue of this. I had a grand mal convulsive seizure. And what happens with a seizure is that every cell in your brain fires at the same time. So all my, all my muscles were convulsing. And it actually drove my teeth through the center of my tongue. And what had actually happened, the pain of that night, I was brought to the hospital in a daze. The family all rallied around me. My poor brother thought I was dead um, when I had the seizure and all the blood pouring out of my mouth. But that night in the hospital, I had this experience where I woke up on the hospital trolley and I tried to pull myself off the hospital trolley and there was this fire extinguisher on the wall. Now, I remember just looking at it. I was like in a trance, just in tunnel vision, just dragged into this vision of this fire extinguisher. And I remember looking at it saying, that's a fire extinguisher. And I was saying, that's the color red. But I couldn't actually put the concepts together. I remember saying to myself, red, fire extinguisher. And I was saying, they should go together. I knew I knew concepts should have gone together, but my brain wasn't working. And I remember looking around the rest of the room. It was like concepts that I knew made sense, didn't make sense anymore. It was like my verbal world fell apart. And I remember thinking to myself, oh my God, that's, that's brain damage. You've done it now, man. Game over. And I was waiting for the sense of dread, the sense of fear, the sense of panic that drove me into our addiction to come over me. But it didn't come. I remember just leaning back on the trolley and just saying to myself, I can't do this anymore. I, I, I just, I give up. I'm gone. And I think that was the surrender I needed. I stopped fighting reality. I dropped the story that I told myself and I stopped fighting with my own mind. And when I dropped that story, that's, uh, that I believe was the defining moment when I was able to trans- tra- uh, completely change my life. Okay, so it was a moment very much of self-acceptance, which, you know, we've yeah. talked to people on the show before, like to Jerry Hussey, who would always talk about this. Um, yeah. and Claire Walsh, actually similar in, 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 in some respects. And that was the moment. And before, before the detox, did friends and family, did, 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 were they, they tried to intervene, that they tried to help, and how did you react to that? 
It was funny. So a lot of so I was in a methadone clinic for twelve years. So I was a registered addict for twelve years in that as well. And family, family and friends tried to help. By the counsellor that tried to help, and they would also try, always try to get at me in a certain way. But the one thing that people said to me was, it was like I had a machine gun, a verbal diarrhea. And if anyone came near me, I would just let that machine gun go, and nobody could get near me. It was like I had an addiction, ego shell, and no one could get near that. I, I've since talked to my counsellors and my key workers, and they said they tried to tackle me with that. I mean friends and family be the same and they said they just walk away exhausted because I've had so many of these little stories and these defense mechanisms where there was just no getting in there so there was just it became pointless for anyone to try to get there in the end and before we move on talk us through that detox I suppose people listening in will have a visual of that I suppose like the train spotting almost comes to mind in, in, in some respect but talk us through how tough that is because presumably it's probably I would imagine it's one of the hardest things anyone could ever have to go through it is. And, and the benzodiazepam detox at home was really, really difficult, but I was really broken. I was just like a, bro- a shell of a person. I was broken. I was still taking methadone because I, I had to stay on that. I couldn't do the two detoxes in one go. So it was really just a broken shell at home, waiting for a month on my couch. Didn't move off the couch. Didn't even go to bed for a month. And then I finally got into the detox to get off methadone. And I actually thought that I wasn't going to be that bad. It's a weaning process when you come off methadone within there. But when I got down to the lower levels then, it really kicked in. And there's, there's two things that I'd say. That, that a lot of people coming off opiates have sort of different uh, symptoms. One of the big symptoms um, is, is your feet going for In certain aspects of you going for but you have this born of fever inside. And it's like, it can be described as flu, but it's like, it's worse than the flu. It's like a fever that cuts to your bones. But to be quite honest, and a lot of addicts coming off and um, going through withdrawal would say that the physical symptoms are manageable. You can cope with the physical symptoms, but it's the emotional roller coaster you go on, like your hormones go all over the place. I, for me, like um, withdrawal is basically the opposite of the of the drug that you took. So it's like the rebound, the reversal of that. So for me, it was like anxiety was like electricity rippling up and down my body. But what really brings it all together is and makes it 10 times worse is the lack of sleep. So I think I went seven or eight days without sleep there as well, which was absolutely crazy. Now, apparently you have these little micro sleeps in between that, like you're probably sitting at breakfast and you have this little micro sleep here and there. But between the lack of sleep, the anxiety, the physical sensations as well, it was the combination of them. Now, I have never, ever, ever considered suicide in my whole life. But I do remember, and I'm not religious either, but I do remember one of the nights, like I used to go down to the kitchen in the detox facility. It was up on a farm up in Knoll. And I go into the kitchen and it'd be like the tick tock of the clock was just going so slow. And I just remember, how am I going to get through this? And I remember looking up at the kitchen. I remember thinking, that's why they take the knives and they lock the knives in a safe at night. And I says, that's why they lock the knives in a safe at night. Now, I wasn't considering committing suicide, but it was just... I, I was for the first time in my life, I'd know where to go. How am I going to get through this? Where do I turn to? It's just, I, I, I thought I couldn't get through it. And my nan, who was very close, had passed away a couple of months previous. And it's probably the only time since I was a kid that I actually prayed to get me through this. And I don't know whether she got me through this. I, I, I'm still not religious. Maybe I should be. But something, something got me through them nights. I'm not too sure what it was. And when you came through the detox, you had your anxiety then to tackle and to take on. And I think anxiety is probably more prevalent than it's ever been before over the course of the last yeah. six months or so. It's come to the fore for lots of people based around COVID and any kind of underlying anxiety is very much coming to the fore. How did you get a handle on that? And how did you deal with that? So that's the funny thing with myself, Carl, was when I, um, on uh, the October the 8th, 2013, that was my first day clean. And I remember waking up, I, there was an energy coming into my life. I learned about, uh, I was reading about Eastern philosophy. I was learning about psychology. And this sort of energy was coming into my life when I, when I was getting clean. And even though I was going through the withdrawals, there was something sort of profound happening to me as well. I, I just call it a perspective shift. And I, I was, I was, I had this intense curiosity to learn about these Eastern philosophies of life, and I was, I was spellbound. I was mesmerized by this stuff I had never heard of before. And on my first day clean, I'll never forget walking out of that kitchen and walking out onto the farm. And it was like, it was like there was an energy in the world. It was like there was a, it was a life in my body. It was like just the world seemed different, wonderfully different. And what I come to realize was that I, I should have suffered enough that night and through the pain of detox, it was like I was forced into the present moment. And I remember walking out onto the farm that morning. It was a beautiful October dew-soaked morning. And I remember the dew drops on the grass. They were like diamonds shining in the, in, the, in the sun that was coming up. 
there was a mist in the air and it was like nature was actually breathing them. And I remember looking around the farm and everything I looked at, all of these objects, was like things that used to be hollow to me just were full of life. They just had this energy inside me. Now, what I've since realized was it was a couple of weeks later where I was getting interested in meditation and stuff. And I, I was down and Asher really sent me to another treatment center. And we were doing a meditation. He says, thoughts come in and thoughts go out. And I remember just having this realization, wow, my mind is so quiet compared to how I used to be. And anxiety had since left me with that perspective shift. Anxiety just sort of faded into the background. And I had this big realization, right? My mind went quiet and anxiety left me. And it was all through a still mind and meditation. So that's what sort of, I, I became fascinated by these questions. What is the nature of human suffering? Why did I suffer? Why am I not suffering anymore? And how can I share this with other people? And that's why I just became fiercely interested in psychology, mindfulness, Eastern philosophies. And it's driven me on today. Like I'm doing a PhD in Trinity College today. That goes into elements of that as well. And that's sort of given me a purpose in life today. And it was that experience of what happened to me. Why don't I suffer? And it's, it's where I am today. Still trying to figure it out. But that's, that's the journey, the path I'm on now. So it's very much the power of living in the moment and this living in the now and that gives you the quietness and, and, and the yeah. ease uh, with which to live yeah 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 and tell us about inner child work it's it's in, it's in the book and I, 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 I saw you mention it in there tell us a bit more about that yeah so inner child work for me is really just so what, 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 if you get anxious now so I, I used to do a lot of public so i still do a lot of public talks but i don't get anxious about them anymore but i have a wonderful relationship with anxiety today but um, I used to, I used to, I, when I started off, I got anxious. But I'm saying, why am I getting anxious? Like, it wasn't Brian now that's getting anxious. It's the conditioned self, the, 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 the child that was anxious in the past. And that brings you in, in, in the present moment. You were anxious before, so you're going to get anxious now. So when I think back of the inf my infant self who went through an operation without a general anesthetic, the, the six-year-old me who looked out the window waiting for his mom and dad to come home from the pub, it's them anxieties. Like, that goes into the body. It's, con it's classically conditioned into your body. Like, the, there's a great book called the body keeps the score like with trauma the body holds on to their memories it's not an eternal thing in your brain not always and for me what i do is my the inner child work that, that I, I work with I, I literally just visualize my old inner child so let's say the six-year-old self i will walk into that room i will walk in behind them i'll put my hand on his i'll give him a hug and i'll just literally say everything is okay i'm looking after you now i'm strong now i have you and it's really just healing your infant self, the one that had no, the one that was struggling in the past, the younger self, the inner child, telling them now that everything is okay. And there's a tremendous healing that takes place in the present moment by healing your inner child because the person in the present moment is wounded by that inner child. So there's like a, a bi-directional healing that happens there. And I, I found this to be a tremendous help in my own life, especially for trauma-related stuff. And it's very much self-comforting or self-assurance, yeah. for want of a better word. We all have moments in time and moments in our life where something happens. And it's, it's, it's reassuring oneself that it is okay. Yeah. And that everything will be okay and everything will be fine. Yeah, hundred hundred percent. That's it. It's and and it, it doesn't have to be this big trauma. It could be anything. Like it could be a spat with a friend. It could be a row with a partner. It's self kindness in a way. It's like being kind to yourself, being good to yourself. Yeah. Talk to me uh, about you know since you you you've, you've, you've come clean. Presumably that's not a straight road. No. Uh, and how if not how do you deal with the the tough times in that? And I think it's a fascinating insight in for people who are listening in because we all have tough tough times in life. Yours will be tougher than, than, than lots of ours. I'm fascinated how you, how, what, how you deal with that and what mechanisms you have in place to help yourself deal with that. Yeah, for bumps in the road, it's a funny one. So, so the one big one I, I had in life, so for, for me, probably the foundations of everything is that living in the present moment and it's building self-awareness. And when I was two years clean, I really started getting obsessed about college. I went back to college. I was getting obsessed. I really wanted to, to do the PhD and I, I was putting myself under a tremendous amount of stress. And I didn't actually realize I'd lost the awareness and I lost that beautiful life feeling that I was given and that I was given back on that day in, in detox. And it was only one day walking in Minute University. I was looking at these giant psychiatrists and I says, wow, I don't see them like I used to. And all of a sudden, it just, I just had this, it was like, it was like a, a, a video clip going on in my head of the last month, couple of months. And I says, oh my God, I've lost that awareness. I've lost that gift, that perspective shift I was given. I'm stressing myself out. And I'd actually start, I actually got a flu in that time. And I'd actually start taking Solpidin again. So I actually had a mini relapse. Taking Solpidin might be that big a deal for other people. For, for someone that's in heroin addiction for a long time, taking Solpidin and Norofen on a regular basis is a very dangerous thing. And I was taking 
more than the amount I should. So I had this big, huge realization. Oh my God, lack of awareness, self-delusion, all of these things were kicking back in, all these habits from addiction. And for me, um, I, 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 I began just focusing on my emotional and mental well-being. I decided to put that before everything else. And that was the only, that was the only way I, I had to live from then. So for me personally, I have just developed a program for my own life. And there's certain practices that I have in my own life of a morning routine that I'm very, very strict about. Um, meditation. I'm always bringing myself into the present moment, self-observation, checking in on myself. And these are the tools that I do. will be really preemptive strategies to catch myself getting lost in the bumps of life before they actually occur. Because sometimes the bumps of life are too much. And when they do happen, um, it can be too late unless you put in that preemptive work. And I think that's really, really important. Okay, so structure is a key thing for you. And finding the, the structure that works for you and holding, yeah. holding dear to that. Yes, because that, uh, because that that gives you kind of the, the the frame to build everything else that you do on. And I know one of the things that you do from reading your book and also you know, seeing your Instagram stuff, you do public talks. You like to help people in lots of ways. And I said it at the start of the interview, you're going to give us five really essential tips that, from your own experience, to help people live life on their own terms. Let's kick off with them and and and, and chat through some of them. Yeah, brilliant. And uh, there's so, so many little tips, but there's it, it a couple that I really love. And uh, the first one is around leaning towards your fears. Like what the biggest learning I've had in life, I was always afraid of my emotions, afraid to be vulnerable. Vulnerable. What I found is that the best things in life are often on the other side of fear. And that really is where true connection is. Like it, 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 it's, it's showing your vulnerabilities, leaning towards challenges, leaning towards your fears. And when you lean towards your fears, I think you really open up your heart. And it's, it's really, I just think great things can come into your life, like taking risks. Like you're rewarded by taking risks, by leaning towards your fears. And I think it's really, really important. It's something that I've done in my own life. I've taken big risks. I laugh at rejection. I don't get, I don't, I don't worry about rejection anymore. Like rejection isn't even rejection. It's only really a thing that's, that's in our head. Because if you don't ask, the answer is always no. So you're not avoiding rejection. You're avoiding an opportunity. So I think lean towards your fears take a risk, take a chance. And if it doesn't go your way, you're going to learn from it anyway. So use it as a learning experience, but there's always different ways of reframing these things when they happen. But if you lean towards your fears, that's where the gold is. It really is. Okay. So shut yourself out of your comfort zone, feet first, go for it and see what Go happens. for it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> and then related to that as well, like reach out to people further along the path. Probably one of the golden, um, Things, the, the most br brilliant, amazing things in my life was reaching out to people further along the path. And a big, I was doing a lot. Of, I was doing a couple of public talks in schools, and I remember thinking to myself, I was doing a black or college. And I remember some of the kids were listening, and some of them weren't. And I had this spark of an idea. Says if I was Brian O'Driscoll's friend, and I was sharing Brian O'Driscoll's um, tools for life, these kids would be listening. Even the sports jocks would be listening. So I decided, why not learn tools and tactics from some of the most uh, uh, influential people in Ireland, and the, the successful people in Ireland? So I literally, I decided to start off in the in the business world, and I l just wrote an email, the highlight called "Taking a Punt." I was just honest. Uh, ridiculously honest uh, I tried to be as passionate I told them about my story told them about everything that I, that I was doing and I reached out to probably 50 of the leading CEOs in Ireland like of uh, Carolyn Lennon from Air uh, Bernard Bourne from AIB and the amount of them that got back to me was absolutely phenomenal so I reached out to people further along the path I interviewed them and asked them tactics for them in their lives but what that turned into from what that turned out into was Mentor, they, I have amazing mentors in my life and amazing connections. Like some of these people, see, I was an only friend, an only friend. And Bernard Bourne himself actually launched me speaking career. He brought me in for a talk, a, a corporate talk in AIB. I got 10 more talks in the different AIB departments after that, that literally launched me speaking career. So by reaching out to people for the land of the path, which is related to embracing your fears, amazing things have come into your life. And again, it's back to that rejection thing. If they didn't get back to me, it wouldn't be that big a deal. Like it really wouldn't. Okay, fantastic advice. Tip number three is uh, life it up. Life it up. Um, I love that. It's, it's a, that's one of my principles for life. So I'll have certain other principles for life. And really for life it up for me, is just when you meet other people or in any encounter you have with other people, it's just to lean in with enthusiasm, awareness, listen, listen to what they're saying 
and just bring joy and delight and, and enthusiasm to every encounter you have to other people. So anytime I meet people, I just say to myself, life it up. And I, need, I don't like the phrase fake it till you make it, but it's from cognitive behavioral therapy because sometimes actions come forth, like you can act your way into feeling good. So if you bring your energy and your enthusiasm and fully aware into every moment you have with others, it helps them, it helps you, and it just makes every interaction better. So that's really a principle I have in my own life that, in every encounter with other people, I try to life it up. Okay, tip number four, listen to your heart. Listen to your heart. And, and this, this comes back, Carl, this comes back to uh, the idea of just pr- present moment awareness. And it's, 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 it's back to fear as well. I, I, always, I always find that so much of the human psyche, especially when you're talking about ego and all of these different things, that if you strip everything away and all of these problematic emotions that you might call them, it nearly always comes back to fear if you bring it all back. And there's a great line, I think it could be in The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho, and I really love it. It's like, don't give in to your fears, because if you do, you won't be able to listen to your heart. So I think what you have to do is listen to your heart, listen to your gut, listen to your, listen to your instincts. It's really quieting the mind. And when you're quieting your mind enough, that's when you have an opportunity to listen to your heart. And it, it still will be a voice, like it will be a voice, but it's a more subtle, a more quieter voice. And it will just be a pull towards certain things. But if you don't quieten your mind and if you don't, bring some kind of present moment awareness into your life, your mind will be too busy and you won't be able to listen to your heart. So I think that's a fundamental practice in your own life is to get yourself in a certain state of mind so you can actually listen to your heart and you can make those right choices. And finally, a tip that we come across a huge amount and it's a, re- it's a, re- it's a recurrent tip that people give us and it's great to, kind of to, to, to bring it up again is about embracing failure and not fearing failure. Yeah, I love it. Like failure, failure is just, it is failure, even failure. This, this was my thing. Like failure is just another path to success. Like I had just some great lines out there. If I fail more than you, I win. And if you hear so many people, like if you're not embracing failure, you're not taking chances. And that's the big thing. And I remember, I love the etymology of words. I love to learn about the meaning of words. And one of them was success. What is success? Because for me, it's internal success. It's not outward success. And I think they go both hand in hand anyway. And I looked up the meaning of the word success and it comes from the latin word um, subsidiary i'm probably butchering that name there but wait with you i'm sure i am but um and what that means is is to come after that's where the word so fail success is to come after and i just said to me it's to come after failure because you don't just have success anyone that has success in their lives whether it's internal or external success it usually comes through failure so if you want to learn and you want to get to a certain level in any aspect of life you've got to be willing to fail and embrace failure and learn from your failings. And I think that is the, is the, that is the key point. And it's, it's really reframing your failures as well. Like if you call a failure, that's a problem. But if you reframe that as the path to success, you're going to lean towards failure as well. You're going to look for failure and smile at failure. I often find myself smiling at my failures, smiling when things go wrong because I know and get closer to where I want to be. I suppose if it's a summarise for the listeners, what we've been chatting about is to grasp life with both hands, go for it, work yeah. hard and believe in yourself, back yourself and just take a punt and take have a, a chance and not, yeah. be, and not be afraid of it. Yeah, 100%, 100%. And I really, it's, it, I, I think it, with, with, with the Irish audience as well, I think, um, I remember when I was writing the book, I remember the, the publisher was saying to me, you don't want to look like you have notions. And I says, I think, I think it's okay to have notions. Like, you know, you know I always hear this thing, uh, to have big, hairy, audacious goals, the bee hags, have the bee hags. I yeah, why not have big, hairy, audacious notions? Like, it's okay to have notions. But you have to, I think that's where the self-awareness comes in as well. So you don't get ahead of yourself. You see reality. You don't get caught up in this. There will be failures. And then when life does get tough, be kind to yourself as well and, and say, right, it's okay to not always be winning. It's, not, it's okay to not always be, to be striving all the time. Sometimes you just have to feel it in your body and sometimes you'll have low points and just settle with that as well. Remind us again of the title of the book. The title of the book is Bonus Time, and it's basically, I, was, I believe I was given a second chance at life. Where I got the name of it, the title of that book was uh, John Boyle from Boyle Sports, the CEO, the founder of Boyle Sports. So he was one of the guys I reached out to. And in my fourth meeting with John, he says, Brian, do you know why you're sitting here today? Because you don't give a crap. You're living on bonus. You're, giving, you're living on bonus time. So that's how I got the title of the book. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, I like it.
Fantastic. And it's available, obviously, in bookstores nationwide. And if people want to find you on uh, social media, where do they find you? Yeah, so if you want to buy the book as well, so my website is Brian, www.brianpenny.com. That's P-E-N-N-I-E. There's a section for the book there. There's a section for videos there. I do online courses. I'm, I'm very interested in the stories we tell ourselves and self-talk. Like when I, I, I believe the language is a vehicle for emotion. That's the research I'm doing. I'm pulling all this together and the neuroscience of all this as well and around the, the online courses that I'm doing. But you get the books there as well. I'm on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, all the different social media and platforms there. I mean, blog is on my website as well. So everything is on the website. Fantastic. Brian Penny, thank you so much for joining us on The Real Health today. Much appreciated. Folks, I've read this book. It's fantastic. and comes highly recommended. So pick it up in a local bookstore or on Brian's website. As ever, we really hope you enjoyed today's episode of Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. You know where we are, realhealth.independent.ie, at Carl Henry PT on Twitter and on Instagram. Don't forget to rate and review. And as ever, we're back next week with more Real Health podcasts. Have a fantastic week, and we'll see you soon. Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry.